Hello, my name is Edwin Rutsch and I created this documentary. This is the second in a series about the Rutsch family history. Part one was about Gerhard Rutsch and this is about Jenny Rutsch from the time she was born to when she immigrated to the United States in 1951. I created the video to learn more about my parents, who they are, where they come from, and to get some clues into why they are the way they are. Also so that I could learn something about myself. Where did the traits, attitudes, values that I was exposed to as a child come from? I had heard many family stories over the years and this project helped place them all into a clearer historical perspective. In July of 2004, Jenny and I spent a month going back and visiting the place she and her brothers and sisters were born. This is the house. We also visited all the places they lived at in Poland and Germany. I thought it would be hard to spend so much time with her, but it was actually a great experience and I think she enjoyed it as well. Little did this family know what would befall them in the coming years. This is still a time of idyllic childhood before the real horrors of World War II would dramatically affect their lives. If you are one of the Tom family descendants, I especially hope this film is of some use to you. Your attitudes and values are most likely in some way influenced by the events in this film. On this DVD you will also find all the photos that we have of the Tom family from the time they lived in Europe. Besides viewing them in the slideshow, there are JPEG copies on the DVD that you can use. You can print them out and use them on your own projects or whatever. On the DVD, there is also a book written by Jenny about her life. It's in a Microsoft Word document and you can read it on the computer or you can print it out. There's also a family tree for the Rutch and Tom families. It's in the family tree maker file format. If you have, um, you'll have to install this program to view the family tree. Just place this DVD in the computer and you can access this material in the documents folder. Feel free to contact me and let me know your impressions. I hope to hear from you. I was born September 23, 1929, in Nadrybia, Poland. I was the second child in the family. My first memories was uh, I was in the kitchen, very small, and my mom was doing something on the table, and I was I wasn't so bad. I wanted. I know what my mom is doing there, but I couldn't reach on the table. I wished I was a little taller so I could look on the table, see what she was doing. My mother was born in Jenschwitza, uh, near Lublin. In 1914, my mom was seven years old when they were taken, all the family was, German families were taken to Kharkov, Russia, as slave labor. Uh, they took them off their farms and then they put Polish people on the, on the German farms.
My mom was seven when she was taken, and she was ten when they came back from Russia. She remembers that um, their grandma would bake donuts with her 18-year-old or the 16-year-old sister at night, and during the day, my mom, at eight or nine, had to stand in the street to sell the donuts to people would buy it, and people that were still rich, maybe the Russians, they would pass by and buy a donut or two from them. They came back, and everything was destroyed. The barns, new barns were burned, used as firewood by the Polish poor people that were managing their farms. And so they had to start all over with nothing. Everything was in the home, was destroyed and gone. And then with the many little children and hungry and no clothes. And, and then she married into our, my father's farm. He was the only son from eight daughters. And my father grew up in Adribia, where my mom married into the farm. Then he was, he was 14 when he was taken, and he was 17 when he came back. Because my father was the youngest and he inherited the farm. So in the olden days they didn't have social security. So they, my, my dad got twice as much inheritance like the others and he got the farm buildings, but he had to take care of the parents. I remember my grandfather, his funeral, it was a Sunday and there, was a, there were a lot of people. He was very well known through his spinning wheel shop and linen machine shop. And now everybody came to the funeral, and his casket was open in a, under a fruit, fruit trees, under a walnut tree in our fruit garden. And then I remember at the cemetery, I was a little girl, about two and three years old, three and a half maybe, and everybody was singing right next to me. I noticed a little girl. She was standing there down close to me, and she had very, very blonde hair and very, very curly hair. I never seen a child with such curly hair, and I thought that was not normal, and I felt like I should take care of it and pull it out. <laughs> then I was so I thought, this is, <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> I have to take care of this, <laughs> of this mess. Yeah, with my both hands, I started pulling, and I'm going to show you having such terrible hair. <laughs> nobody else nobody else has hair like you. This is not normal. I thought, I'm going to make her not normal looking girl. I <laughs> thought pulled her hair out. Then I started pulling, and she started screaming, and her dad reached down and picked her up on his arms. And then he kept singing again. He kept singing again. And I stood there <laughs> without a job. <laughs> I didn't feel guilty because I didn't know any better. I was so little, so so I didn't. I wouldn't do it today. <laughs> but when you're a child, you don't. You just this is just a, what comes into your mind. You do. Then grandmother was kind of lonely, I think, and she loved Valley and me a lot. And and um, then she wanted us to sleep with her in her bedroom, the empty bed, and so we kind of grew up there. And then every night when we went to bed, she would say, now children, what story should I tell you tonight? It was so interesting, the stories. And, and then the stories, one was a little story about a little, the little girl, the basket, how her mother died, and then she helped to take care of her old father. And she too, so she was so caring. And then I was, I, I was wanted to be so, so caring like she was when I grew up. And I was what, I was like a little mother to my brothers and sisters. I always would make sure they don't get hurt. And my sister was two and a half years older than I am, but she couldn't care to watch me, not to get in trouble or fall off a tree or anything. But I always said to take care of her. Once she fell down and hurt her arm, they had to take her to the doctor. The doctor put it back in the way it should be, and she was up on the tree again. And I was, I was scared when she was on a tree again. She went fall off, and I ran to mom, and mom, Valley is on it. I felt like I was responsible for her well-being, even if she was older. And then sometimes she was angry at me, and I was scared to go on a tree because I was very scared of, of uh, caterpillars. I thought they were the ugliest things. If I was on a tree, and I saw a cat pick cherries, and I, there was a 
a caterpillar, I would ro crawl down as fast as I could because I thought the caterpillar is going to be after me and bite me. And then I would beg Wally, pick me some cherries, and she was, no, you tattletailed on me, and I'm not going to pick your cherries. Pick them yourself. We had this deep ditch there where people make turf for firewood. The cows would always get their water out in the meadow. So the boys were swimming, they were running, and then short before the deep ditch, they would grab onto the grass, throw themselves head over heels, and then into the water, and then swim. And Wally was three years old. She was watching them, and she thought, I can that too. It looks like fun. She grabbed on the grass, threw herself into the water, and the water was about maybe five feet deep, six feet deep, maybe more. And then she came, she came down, she went down once and came up, and then she came, went down again and came up and they grabbed her. But the hair pulled her out, the cousins. So she was not afraid of nothing. Ellie was born March 15, 1935. And about April, people cut potatoes for planting in the, in the barn. And Grandma would, wanted to be there too, a little bit, help. And then, and I was supposed to babysit her, and she screamed and screamed and screamed, and I, I didn't know what to do with her anymore. I did everything I could, and she screamed, and I was out of my, my love for anybody, <laughs> baby already, and just wanted to free. I wanted to be free, play like other children. And so I ran to the barn, and everybody else was there. The maid was there, and all the other workers were there, and Grandma was there too, and I complained. I do everything I do, she still screams, and I don't know what to do anymore. I don't want to babysit her anymore. And Grandma says, well, Mrs. Klinkevich was here a couple of days ago, and she says, she asked you children if you would give her away, and you said no. I'll go over there, the neighbor Polish lady, and ask her, maybe she still wants, still wants her now. And so I was so happy. I thought this was just the best thing that could happen to me. Easiest way to get rid of my screaming sister and be free like other children are. So I went, I ran over real fast and hoped that she would say yes. And when I, had, I came close to the door, Mrs. Deutschlander, a German lady from the other side of Klinkiewicz, stood at the door, stood in the door with Mrs. Klinkiewicz. And I say, Mrs. Klinkiewicz, you were at our house and you wanted the baby and we said no, but you can have her now. <laughs> would you like her? Would you still like her? And I still remember I was too little to understand that they were kind of grinning to each other and kind of whispering something and they had the biggest fun with me. And I didn't, I was, I was so serious. I thought big people don't laugh. They don't make fun of other people. They're just so perfect. They're ready to go to heaven any time, you know. Only children are, can be bad, but big people, they, I was uh, very honest. And she turns to me and says, Mrs. Deutschlander has an Ellie. She did have a little girl, Ellie, too, Mrs. Deutschlander. She has a little girl, Ellie, too, and hers is prettier than yours, so I'm going to take hers. And <laughs> my heart broke. I was so depressed because I felt I have to go back to the jail. <laughs> you know? And so I walked home slowly, and then I went into the barn and told my mom, what Mrs. Klinkiewicz said, and they were kind of grinning. Then my mom, she says, well, then you have to go back and take care of Ellie. Go back to jail. And I was crying hard, I went, I had to go. My mom says we, had a, we were the only ones in town that had a stork nest in our barn. And the storks were catching, uh, catching frogs in our meadow. I was walking in the meadow, catching frogs, and taking the little nest for the babies. And then I asked my mom, where did the babies come? But the stork, that's what they always used to say, the stork brought, brought a baby. And then where did the babies come from? Well, the stork makes them. And then what does he make them out of? Out of frogs. And I remember she gave a bath to Ellie, and Ellie was living there naked in a tiny baby in a, in a bathtub. And I looked at Ellie and I had such a, all of a sudden, such an ugly feeling that this is, she's made out of frogs. And I was, I was thought they were so ugly and now my sister was made out of frogs. I believed everything people told me. And then I had an idea. I wanted to stop the babies coming, you know, I thought maybe I can help it. And so I just 
told me, Leah, I was, she laughed that it was, I was a baby in her home. And so I thought I have to stop it. So, but Leo came over, play, and Irving, and there was fine pieces of wood outside there, for they chopped the wood. And I had a little apron, and they helped me put the wood pieces, little pieces in my apron, and we we're gonna throw them onto the, onto the straw barn, feed barn, where the stork was, and chased the stork nest away. I thought then they were gonna get scared, but we couldn't throw very much higher than the beginning of the roof. So the stork stays, we couldn't help it. Leo, he was always the one that knew how to bad thing. But we followed Leo. He was the only child we felt. He was always, he had more toys than we had, and we thought he was the big shot, you know. He would show us to take cotton and then put newspaper around and then put a piece of cloth around. And then we would sit in a ditch behind the barn and we would smoke. And then when we were bored, we would go smoking. But Liv and Leo came over in the ditch. And then our fingers were a little yellow already. And then one time we were in a barn, and a, and a wheat barn up high with all wheat. And we were sitting up on a barn smoking. And Grandpa comes on in unexpected, and he sees us smoking. And he was in shock. If a little bit would have fallen into the straw, a whole farm would have been in, in burned down in a short while. And he went into Grandma's kitchen, and Grandma was there. And he, he complained, upset, but we did. He thought he was going to get sympathy from Grandma, and she was very quiet. She says, "They're doing, they're learning from you." She says, and he didn't. I don't remember that he spanked us. In 1938, or. 13 farmers in our little Nadribia, our Baptist families that belonged to a church. We didn't have a church. We used to meet at home in homes and then built a beautiful little church. I enjoyed going to Sunday school, and for me, church was very serious. We children usually had Sunday school in the afternoon, maybe at 2 o'clock, and we didn't go to church in the morning when the big people went, only in the evening, in the afternoon. And one time, Closer to the evening, there was a, supposed to be a special service for grown-ups. And then I went to the big people's church, too, and my mom was surprised to see me there because church was very important to me. I was just the only child coming out. I was on my appointment, too. Mom couldn't believe it that I came. Everything the pastor said meant so much to me. He was talking to big people, but I, and for me it was very serious because Grandma teached her to pray and be good. I remember when I asked my mom if Jesus can see through the ceiling, and she says yes. Can she see through this heavy wooden panels, whatever? Can he see, see through that too? And she says Jesus can see us everywhere. And then I thought, Maya, I have to be very good because <laughs> he has to make sure if he sees me doing bad, that I might not go to heaven. And I wanted to go to heaven. Mostly when we were, like the children were playing out in the meadows and other children went to gather and play and swim at other families' backyards, fields, and we were supposed to stay home. We were never allowed to go. So we know if we asked my mom, we wanted to go so bad. And if we would ask, we would, mom would say no. And we, So we knew we were going to get a spanking, but we went anyway. And then my mom... When we came home from the Pearl's house, my father's sisters, I remember one time, and then when we came home, the first thing we would look on our china cabinet when we walked, my mom was not in the kitchen, but we looked up in the china cabinet, there was this willow branch, and we knew, that was just like, oh, that sentence. We were standing in the entrance hall before the kitchen, waiting for mom, because we knew that she would take her. The kitchen door would be open, and she would, when she walked in, she wouldn't say a word, because we knew when the branch was there, what the branch was for. She didn't explain nothing ever. She just took the branch and Polly first. She was the oldest, and she screamed and she was beating. Later on in life, she told us she was never sorry for us. She never felt sorry for us when she was beating us. And then she screamed, Polly screamed and screamed, and Mom just kept beating, beating. Bali would go in the corner and cry his heart out, and then I knew I was next. And I always wished that it would be an hour later when the beating was over. <laughs> he was so scared. Mom had no mercy. 
And then was, after I was finished, poor Erwin had to watch. Fanny was the luckiest, she got the first. So by the time her turn came, she was finished with her getting spanked. And then we would all stand in the, in the corners and cry, 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 because it was still hurting. Yes, remember, I remember when my mom came, went, when my mom, the day before, so she went to school to, to um, write me in as a new student, you know. And I had new shoes and cute little dresses and nice sweater. I was dressed nice and the neighbors, the Saruka children were so poor. I remember when I came, my mom came to write me in, how they all stood around and looked at me like, like this must be a millionaire, and we were not rich, you know. We were just making a living, but we were had more than they had, and they were just came to school bar barefoot. And I'm at third day of school, and at last recess, we play. We were playing ball in the outside in the play yard there. Yeah. We were with three girls, and we were, let's go to the forest, which was a half a mile away, and we're gonna pick mushrooms. The story sounded a little funny to me. To recess, go to the to go to the forest for pick mushrooms. In those days, we would have little black aprons with little ruches around. They were cute, and so I had something to put my mushrooms in. And we were gone for maybe an hour, and we had so many mushrooms. We were so excited about the many mushrooms we could find. And well, then let's go home back back to school, and we come to school. And the school was closed, and we were in fear because our books were in there. So I came home, and I was scared. And Grandma says, where are your books? I said, somebody took him. I was, you know, when you're so scared of the branch, you just you have to lie a little bit <laughs> to save your skin. And then she says, oh, she was a good heart, and she believed me. And she says, after you're going to be in school for a while, you're going to fight for yourself, you know, not let everybody do what they want with you. And I thought this was very understanding for Grandma. <laughs> and next day we come to school, and before school started, really, the teacher said, calls me and calls the other two girls, and I had to stand behind the blackboard, and one had to stand by the locker where the books were in, where the books were in. She locked them in, in the locker, and the other one was standing in the other corner. And so I learned a lesson. I knew that this all teaches us a lesson. Everything we do wrong, from our wrongs, we learn something, don't we? I was in school maybe eight months or so, just before the first semester was over. Sometimes I walked over the fields, and sometimes I walked the streets. The streets were over the fields. There was a dog that people lived in the field that chased me a lot, it was mean. And then I swept the streets, and almost every house had dogs that chased you. So every day you were scared to go to school and scared to go home. <laughs> Went to school and started stopped at my girlfriend's house. She was watching the cows by the road, and she says, "Wait for me. I'm watching the cows. Somebody's going to take my place, and then I walk with you." And I waited, and she was the little girl was there holding the dog on a on a line. <coughs> then the dog started dashing toward me, and I ran away and fell. And the dog bit me and bit a hole and bit through the main vein main, main that went through the lake. Mm -hmm. So the blood was just gushing out to the other lake and I was full of blood. And I stayed for th all through the school and after school I walked home. Then the pain started worse and worse. And uh, by the time I got home, my, my knee was stiff already. I could barely walk anymore, the two kilometers. And when I walked in, they took uh, uh, some kind of straw, rye, I think it was rye, straw, it was supposed to be good, and then they cooked, they put boiling water over, and they gave me a bath in that. That was supposed to heal me. The straw was dusty, you know. I was in constant pain, my knee was swollen, but then they finally took me to the doctor the next day. And, and he says, take her to Lublin to the doctor quick. And the next day they took me to Lenchner, and then they were supposed to find there with the bus to Lublin, but then they, they waited, shopping around, around a little bit, my parents, and then they, by the time the bus, 
they, the bus was gone already. I think they took me home, and the next day they took me, and by that time it was too late, so they had to have surgery. Had to have surgery. So this whole thing, they must have taken some bones out too. They took this whole thing here, about five inches, and two, two by five inches took bones out and took out the flesh out in the, in the hospital. And I remember Grandma was there, highly pregnant, and she watched me taking me to the operating room, and I screamed. She was standing in the hallway, and I grabbed her. I didn't want to let her loose. I was so scared to be operated. And he stayed for a for a week. We stayed there, and then we came home, and and then I got worse again, so they had to take me to another hospital. And it was a children's hospital in Lublin. I stayed there, I think, two weeks. And that was like hell on earth. When they put this casa into this hole here, deep, and then it dries out after two days. And then the, the Catholic nun was um, would just pull it out. And she, I had to promise her that I am not going to stay a Baptist. She hated me because I was a Baptist so bad. She would do anything to cause me hardships. I promised her so hard I become Catholic. So everything so she wouldn't hurt me so much anymore. I screamed, Jesus, Jesus, I thought. So she was, my mercy. Why you say Jesus is the same? Yes, it's in Polish. She will know that she have mercy. She didn't. I wonder if she if I meet her in heaven someday. Dad checked me in in hospital, so the two weeks later when he came to check me out, then this this Catholic nun wanted to give me one more hard time. She says the doctor was there was a table not far from where my bed was, and the, the doctor was talking to my dad to check me out there, and then she came. She still came to me and says, "Who is this that wants to take you out?" And I said, "That's my dad." She says, "If you say that's your dad, you have to stay here longer. You cannot go home." And then I was so scared to stay in this hell much longer. And, and then uh, she, uh, co she constantly came back. If you say this is your dad, then you cannot go home. You have to stay. And then so I lied. I said, this is my uncle. What's his name? Well, which uncle should I name? Otto Scheele, I was. And then she goes to the doctor and, and to my dad. And she says, you're not her dad. She, Jenny says that you're her uncle, that you're Otto Scheele. And then my dad was shocked. How does she know she's not my child? And then Dad took me home, all the way home from Lublin on a wagon. I was laying in the back of the wagon, and he was driving, and, and he didn't say a word. He was just deep, deep in distress. And the next morning, Grandma comes to me, sits on my bed, and she says, uh, Why did you tell the Catholic nurse that Uncle Otto Scheler is your father? And then I told her about how she treated me, that I had to lie to get it, because otherwise I was so scared to stay there longer, and they can pasture me with the more pain. Then my aunt came and visit us. Me and my mom's sisters came from Nienschwitzer too. And then they, the aunts went home, drove home that night, I think, or I know it was evening, to Lublin, Nienschwitzer. And then they told me they're going to take me with her, with them. So I went with them. So my mom's older sister, Olga, with she used to try to doctor everybody. She had a bomb chatier machine. It's just like a, it's like round and has long, long and black. And then here is maybe thirty little needles, maybe this long. And she's going to, she would dip that in oil and pull in the back and then would flip back into my foot. And she would, then it would have full of holes and full of blood coming out of every little hole. She would dip that in oil. And then she was, she wanted to get the bad blood to come out. <laughs> I would scream. I was so scared of that because it hurt so much. But 20 years later, she told me, it's, you got better only because I did those treatments to you. So I was there for a whole month. I lived with Tante Lydia and then with them for a week. And then and, uh, Jenny Ulke, Hoffman, still lived right next to it, and Grandma. And so my mom's stepfather lived there, and my mom's brother lived there, all very close to each other. Tante Valia I liked best. Tante Olga was nice too. 
important to me I was kind of mean to me <laughs> she spanked me because <laughs> I ran off to when I was little I ran off to uh, half months I went outside and I ran off to half months when she came back she spanked me in those days everybody spanked that's how my parents grew up and that's how they spanked their kids and that was just a way to raise a child Christian way <laughs> We were, we were threshing wheat or rye in a barn. Neighbors were helping us, working for us. And we were threshing it was September 1st. The weather was nice, was peaceful. We were working. All of a sudden, it was in the afternoon, maybe about 2 o'clock or so, a little wagon comes down with the one horse, and the one man sat in, in front, and one man was standing in the back. He stopped quick, told my parents that my dad has to be ready in 30 minutes. He has to have food and clothing for three days. And, and we didn't know why. I don't think he told us why. And we were in shock. We thought they were going to take the man away from and kill him. And, and uh, we had no idea that the war, we had nothing to do with Hitler. I don't even know if they knew who ruled, who's ruling Germany. And we were happy in Poland. We got along well with the Polish and with the Ukrainians and the Jews and the whatever. Everybody liked each other. We got along nicely. But everybody was gathered. Then they took him to Tsitsov. And from there, we didn't even know where they were for, for two weeks. And in Tsitsov, the policemen took everything away. First they took the clothes away. And then they took, when they wanted to take all the food away, my dad hold down, but didn't want to give all the food. And then the policeman hit him. Then they took him for, so away, and they had to march for, for days with no food and no water. And then they, some of them f collapsed. Like our neighbors, the Schachtschneider, his brother, couldn't walk anymore, and they just shot him to death. We had no idea where they were or what had happened to them, if they're dead or still alive. And then I remember it was one Sunday, our whole house was full of refugees. The Polish people were so scared of the war. Hitler was, took over real fast, Poland real fast. And so from Lublin, from everywhere, the Polish people were in such fear. And so they came with walking and with wagons and, and full of wagons and hungry people. And some of them were very poor, so now they had to travel for days. And so they would. But they stopped at night, they needed a place to rest. So our barn was full, and the wheat barn was full of refugees, and the cow barn, wherever, and our house was full. My mom was so good to them. She would take our feather beds, roll them together to make the refugee people and the children that we had in the house sleep with their heads on, on our feather beds. I remember one time two police families were come to our house at night, and wanted to stay with us. My mom made them a nice dinner and to see, served them in the other room, in the dining room, just like company. That night, the soldiers came and wanted their horses and my mom then went into the living room, the dining area, and told them that she was eating with them there. She says that, told, told them that they want their horses. And the police families went out, policemen went out and told them these are police horses. They were lying to the, so their only soldiers. They, so they wouldn't take our horses. One evening, uh, a police soldier came in, and he was in such rage. I think if my dad would have been home, he would have killed him with a revolver in his hand, just like a demon possessed with hate toward the Germans. He came in and looked under the beds and all over the house with his revolver ready to shoot. He was looking for dad. My mom told him he's not dead. Then he wanted the horses, and we had the new barn finished, and the horses were in the barn. And he went into the horses, and my mom just stood behind the, for the horses, before the door. She locked the door for the horse barn, and she stood before them, and she's not going to give him the horses. We need the horses. And he was so enraged that she was not giving in, because he thought he was God, and she was just an animal, a German animal. 
And we children stood around and we were in such horror, fear that he's going to shoot mom now. And fear, I ran on to my aunt, Tante Ida Sheila. She lived the second house from us, the third house from us. And we brought her over there to help us because the soldiers there, he's killing my mom. And so, this, people, this was a lot of fear during those times. The men were gone. And then all of a sudden, one, two, about two weeks later, we woke up in the morning and dad was home. So they let him go, it was, it was still alive. That was shot before the German army came, our fathers came back. All of a sudden, on a Sunday morning, the German army, we heard the German army came into town. And then our house was full of soldiers. And then they went into several guns, the soldiers went into the Klinkiewicz house and the Klinkiewicz, and they were saying, saying cafe, cafe, and they didn't know what cafe means. And so the, the old grandma from Klinkiewicz came over and I went over there because I spoke Polish very perfect and German. And so I asked them what they wanted, that they said they want cafe. And so I told them they want coffee, and they were so happy to clean Kivish. That's all they wanted was coffee, and they quickly cooked them coffee, everything. Yeah, now, after these German people came back, one of them, uh, the farmers didn't have time to be policemen, so they had to have German police walking there through town at night and during the day. And so they made policemen out of two German men, or neighbors. They were just laborers, farm laborers. They didn't know how to behave decent. And so now, since they had gone through so much being mistreated by the Polish, by the Polish for two weeks, when they came back, they were full of hate, some of them. And uh, they were not Christians, so that they could forgive. And uh, so they would go, would walk the streets with, with, the, with um, guns. And the, now the Polish people were very scared of them, Gilkevich too. And then one time they stopped into Klinkiewicz and, and just sat there and just to scare him a little, pay him back, because that's what they had to gather to be taken away, this concentration place there. And um, so Grandma Klinkiewicz came running over to our house and please come and help us there, over there. My mom goes over, she says, well, what am I going to do quick? I still remember she was upset. She wanted to help them, so but what am I going to do? How am I going to do? We were not supposed to buzz in now, you know, do something to help them. And so my mom took this butter churner, you know, it's a churn, it's this churn, 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 till the butter comes, develops. And she took the butter churner like if, if it just hap had, happens that she has, she's there to bring the butter churner back. And then when she comes in with the butter churner, it was all butter churner, but she just wanted to fool this German man. And she says, what are you, you doing here? And they got smart. And they asked, like my mom was her, Polak friend, you know, and and, and uh, so, and then she said she told him to leave, and that made him angry, and then they left, but that made him angry. So later on, my dad was plowing way far away from home in the in the field, and he could when they walked to the streets, the policemen then they shot over him. His bullets were always close to my dad's head to scare him. And one night they were, I went over there to their house to Klinkiewicz because so she was like a friend. She was a little older than me, by his age. And then they begged me to stay overnight because sometimes they would be scaring them at night. So they wanted me to stay. Could you stay overnight here and sleep here tonight? And they treated me like a pr protective angel. And I went home to ask my mom if I could stay over there at night. And she says yes. And so they were so happy that that night they had a German child that they felt more so, so, you know, protected. And right after, short after that, we heard that we were going to move away some. The German government is going to take us out. Nobody knew where to. A year later in September, just one year later, we had to move. But Dad didn't want to move. He was just, this is mine. This is one of my forefathers worked for this farm, and I'm not leaving. Everybody was packing. In three days, we were supposed to leave. My dad was stubborn. He put his horses by the by the machine and went out plowing, but probably for the plow, but not plowing. And my mom was angry. She, she almost cried. She says, "What are you doing? We need to pack. We have to leave." And then when they, when they, the day when we were supposed to leave, we were not completely ready. And then this German 
high official that was supposed to gather everybody together to make sure everybody meets there at the Klinkiewicz place. Then he yelled at us, and some of them had a big mouth, you know. He yelled at us that we're not ready yet. And all we did was we packed with just one new bedroom set for my parents and, and the sewing machine, and the rest we had to leave. All the farmers with their wagons had to get it, and all the farms, the farm, the horses with wagons full of people, and it's a lot of people took a lot of with them. Packed, and we didn't, we did only took hardly anything. And we had just paid off the farm, and to build a new house farm with a huge new brick barn, and paid that off, and then and we didn't get much money from from the wheat harvest because we left everything for the Polish people there that was going to take over. And then when we three days later we came to to Cap Mines, they had given they had prepared a farm for us that looked a lot like our farm there, a new brick barn with a room for cooking. That that farm looked a lot like our farm, but there was only one room, a cement floor, the kitchen. And the second room was just a small room with sand floor. Sand was not, was not finished yet. And they put us in with eight people. My mom just sort of stood, sat there, stunned. And my dad comes in and he says, well, we're going to have to unpack. And she says, no, we're not unpacking. I'm not going to stay here. And she started crying. As she says, I'm going back. I still have this much money. And I'm not staying here in this house. And grab that would always be everything. Somebody says, it's okay, you know. He would take everything that everybody tells him, but my mom didn't. The man from government that was taking care of it. And so he comes in and he looks at the kitchen, large kitchen, cement floor. And, and so he says, nine, nine, this good and this would not go. And then they brought us to this Schwinkas farm. They were already gone. And, and, um, he says the barn was beautiful, a newer barn, a newer uh, shipping for all the wagons, storage for all the horses, and a beautiful strop, large st hay barn, I mean wheat barn. But the house was just very, very old. And he says, uh, if you take this one, we're going to build you a new house soon. About two years later, they, built, they did build us a new house. Dad was never happy there. This was not his own. You know, but what could we do? We were just, had to call like little sheep. First, when we got there, there was no teachers. The teachers were in the war. And so we didn't have no school. And then we didn't have school for a long time. So my mom, I was worried. Other kids were so happy that there's no school. That here we have a good life. We can just play on a farm and work on a farm and no, no study. But I was, I didn't know, I was so... I was sensitive. I would. I couldn't sleep. I was worried, and then I told my mom. She had my worries to my mom. Oh, I'm gonna grow up and be dumb and not knowing nothing if there's no school. And then my mom talked it over with my uncle, and he took me with them to Tarnovko. I went to school there from February till June, I think, or July. And then school was out, and I think I was in the third grade then. And I, and I was very. Um, Homesick, terribly homesick for my brothers and sisters, especially for Uncle Eddie. He was my little brother that I took care of like a mother. And Uncle Eddie was about um, eight months old or ten months old, or so he already started walking. And I still carried him around because I didn't want him to use his little feet, save his little feet. Carried him around in the garden. And then after that, I came home. Uncle Eddie came running down. He, was, he came down, running on his little feet toward us, and I looked the other way. I cried for joy to see him again. And then when I came home, it was such a different feeling. Home sweet home, uh, it, it's nothing but when you're a child to have your own home, your own mother and father and your sisters and brothers. It's so nice to have so many sisters and brothers. Everybody, they treated me like a little queen. They were so happy to see me again. And they, they shared the cherries that they saved for me, too. And this was just so, I was so happy to be home again. Then there was no school again, so my mom and I was worried again. So three miles from us was Chalkovo, and there was a German teacher. He was a decent, older teacher, nice. And my mom went over there and asked if he did would accept a farmer's child in a city school. 
and he took me in. I like poems. When we had a poem, we, we know in a reading book there was next week we would have a poem in a reading book. Then I would on Sunday would sit down and go on the roof where I was out of myself, where the car machinery was in. And I would sit there on Sunday afternoon all by myself because I know next week we'll have to learn this large poem, long poem. And um, then I would study the poem already with many verses, you know. And then when the next week when we got to that poem, and then I do the whole long poem already. She was, most people didn't even learn the first couple sentences by heart. And I would go forward and know the whole poem. Barely in all those years I can scrape together, maybe five years, barely. But I graduated from sixth grade. I remember one time I had a little spot on my apron and I wouldn't with cross-stitchery cross on it. You know, by an apron with lots of cross-stitchery on it and nice. And, and it was a little spot. Instead of asking mom to wash that out a little bit before I go, I didn't want to go to school. And I walked to the street and I came back and my mom beat me. And you just go now. And But I knew I'm going to get a spanking when I come back. But I read I got a spanking and, and uh, didn't want to go to school because of that little spot. And the children would look at the spot and make fun of me or whatever. I was so sensitive. You know, when I was, I remember I was eight years old and my mom, I would say, take a broom and kitchen, clean out the kitchen. And I hated to sweep the kitchen. Mom said, I have to do so I do it in the middle quick and be ready quick. And then she would look around the corner and said, there's still something there, do it again. And I would cry, I don't want to do it anymore. If there's something else, if you keep crying and don't do a perfect job, you're going to get a spank in it. So this just, just pushed into me. So if you do a job, do it right. When you're done, you can look back at with pride that you did, did a perfect job. So I would always help my mom from childhood on, but since Uncle Eddie was born, besides the living room was not perfect, clean. I would say, tell him, let's make Mutti happy when she comes back, surprise her, and then we clean, we made the beds perfect. And then we mopped the floors and we put the dollies right. And, and then when mom come home, she was she's going to be so happy. We're going to make her happy. I remember one time she came home and there came the Polish, the Polish uh, teacher. And then he came and my mom had just come home from town. And she said, oh, how can I invite him into the living room? It's not perfect. And then she comes in and it was perfect. And she praised those kids. She was so proud of us. <laughs> And that felt so good, you know. We were not all bad. We were good, too, you know. It make Mom happy, and then she loved us more. Marianne, my cousin, came to visit. She was 16, and they were outside by the mailbox. And Marianne was dancing with Wally there. And they were dancing. I think I, I don't think I was dancing. And, uh, and I probably tattled till to Mom that Wally is dancing again. <laughs> and Wally is dancing. Because for us it was a terrible sin to dance, or go to dances. That's what a sin is, you know. And then I think I tell the other funny because I, I, I didn't want her to go to hell. <laughs> and I always felt like I have to be the mother for Wally too. Fire, fire, oh. Aus dem Kaisertänzchen zu geben, fire, fire, oh. Luftig ist es im grünen Wald. When you're 14, you start developing uh -huh. and middle of you need a brow or whatever. But I could, when I went to school, I didn't want the boys to see that I'm starting to develop. I didn't want the dress to be real flat made. I wanted it to put ruching in here so it would loose here. You know, if you put a little ruching here, then it would be loose here. I wouldn't show nothing. That I'm yeah. developing, otherwise the boys might laugh at me, whatever. That's how I, I felt like. We went to church to Posen. There were 67 miles. We had to take the train only once a month. And then every Sunday morning we had home fellowship. And that was such a blessing for us. Because from outside world, no God, only, only Hitler, everything. And, and no church services in the morning. I was about... 13 and I was very sick and very sick and so at that time all of a sudden the war came closer and I 
and all of a sudden, that hit me. What would you do if we would die now? Would you be ready to meet our Savior? And this is the time you should become a Christian now. And then this was Easter when we were baptized, and then the farm hand took us to Straka to the train station, and then we went with the train, and then we walked 15 minutes to the church, and then a Sunday morning, and then it was supposed to be the baptism. In the morning, we had the service, and then at lunchtime, since it was war, the city people could not give us lunch, so we brought some of our own cake and other good stuff, sandwiches from our farm. And all of a sudden, my cousin Stefan, Povra, and Erwin, my brother, came in from the outside pale, like a white wall, and said, three sets of planes are coming toward Posen. For the first time, Posen is going to be bombed. And everybody was in shock, and all of a sudden, uh, the sirens went off, started going all over the town the, that were getting bombed. Everybody had to go into the bunker. There was a bunker in our backyard, church backyard. And everybody went into the bunker, and as soon as we ever went in, the bombs started falling. <laughs> But when the bomb hits so close by, one after another, it's just every time a bomb hits, it you you can't hear. It's just a shock so much. The noise and the whole earth shakes, and uh, it's just like the whole world is coming to an end. Across the street, there was an ammunition factory, war ammunition factory, and a lot of people were working there on Sundays too, and and that was bombed constantly, and people was in our bunker, people were screaming and praying and singing, and uh, it was horrible. And then the bombs were constantly being bombed, the ammunition factory, and then then the ambulances were taking the dead and the dying and up to the hospitals. And then we, in the afternoon, after everything was quiet, there was still, all afternoon, the, the ammunition was exploding, still exploding, that was bombed. Still hard to explode, constantly like somebody shooting there. But they were, I think it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon that they Baptism was supposed to be, and the water was kind of too cold, so very cold they couldn't heat it up in a tank in church, the baptism water. And uh, doing that, that, all that noise from the ammunition factory and the ambulance, and then we were baptized there. Yeah. And then in the evening, so we couldn't go to, to the train station because the train station was bombed. A lot of people were dead there and injured. We had to walk and walk to the with the street to street cars, and, and people many people were bound bandaged they were hurt, and uh, we had to walk to the next train to the next train station. We that night about midnight or so we finally arrived home. I was so scared the, the sirens and everything and you know you don't understand it that this is still in your body in your mind. When we, the, the flood was supposed to come in 1997 uh, in Rio also, when the dam broke, and we had to be evacuated for a day or so. We already knew we have to be ready any minute. When they come, tell you, then you have to be ready. And then all of a sudden the sirens go around, start howling, and the uh, sheriff drives to town with his horn and screams out loud all over town, evacuate this area, evacuate this area immediately. And I start screaming. The dog comes, you know, the ass comes back. Somehow it's shake. I, I couldn't have even driven the car. I got into the car quick. Charlie was supposed to drive us to the villa's house up higher on the hill, just a mile away, half a mile. And I would not have been able to drive the car. That's how shaken I was and just hear the sirens again. But then the war was coming closer and closer. Russians were coming closer and closer already. 
the news was always saying, oh, planmäßig geräumt. We planned it that way that we had to leave them, this city. We planned it that way. Okay. Six days before the Russians came into our town, the, they took the men away to Volkssturm. They were supposed to fight the Russians now because most of the soldiers were dead. Now they took the young boys already. And the old man, the, I think on the 16th, he was called and on the 20th or so we had to run away with horse and buggy. We took that to the train station and all our neighbors, the older men were there too already. From there they took him to away and I don't remember where they took him then to Foxtrum. They were supposed to fight in a war. Uh, four days later, on, I think it was a Saturday morning, Wally comes over. I was going to go to the bakery to work. And Wally comes over and says, we have to leave today in a few hours. Come home now. And then around noon, everybody's supposed to gather and come eins and we, we left. There was no, no track leader, no nobody. Everybody did as he pleases. And was what I can understand, Uncle Hoffman, Tante Wally, mom's, mom's uh, brother-in-law, Tante Wally Hoffman's husband was there. And so he left that morning, go to the train station, and he tells my mom, don't run away from the Russians, we're not, we're going to stay too. Now my mom was very attached to her sisters and brothers, and so she she didn't work very fast. She, she came down and she told me, I acted very slow when we packed because I really didn't want to run away because they're not going to run away, they're going to stay. That was the silliest thing my uncle ever did to tell us to stay. And when he came home, the first thing they did was pack and leave. We packed two wagons with four horses, two horses on each wagon. One family, the one refugee family that could go with us, they drove one, one wagon, and we were all on one on the other wagon, with just on the bottom beds and snow and straw, and we all covered ourselves with feather beds. And that's what the coats on and sat there in the wagons for three days. And when it snowed, it snowed right on top of us, night, night, day. They didn't, they didn't give us anybody to lead the track of all the wagons with the mostly women and children and old people. The men were in the war now. There was no husband. And so everybody did what he wanted. We were supposed to, we couldn't go the highway because that's where the war machinery was going in the highway. So we had to go to the fields and field ways and all around it was dangerous. Our horse, one of our horses had been taken away to dig ditches in the war, for the war before, a couple of days earlier. And he must have, they must have beaten him a lot, the horse. And he was, he had a piece of flesh hanging on his mouth and he was overworked and already and sore. He couldn't eat very well. And now he was supposed to pull the wagon for so many days. And so on the way, we were out of a couple of towns and then we had to stop at a farmer's place for the night because the horse just couldn't go. He would lay down, he couldn't go anymore. And one Polish man told the other one, these poor people, by tomorrow they'll probably be all shot to death by the Russian soldiers. They were, Russian soldiers were very close already. And so when my mom heard that she was scared, we were the only German family there. So we went back again. The horses had rested for about an hour already. And so we just went into the street again. We left our track now, you know. They were ahead of us now. We didn't know where, where to go even. And uh, so a couple of other cars passed by, German cars too, we followed them. And then we went short to for Shrim. Took three days to go close to Shrim. There was a bridge to go over the Shrim bridge. And we were shot before the bridge, and it says they're gonna explode the bridge so the Russians are close, so the Russians wouldn't be able to follow them. They have to go, we had to go back from the bridge, away from the bridge, because they're exploding the bridge. So I didn't see the bridge, but we were very close by. So Mrs. Greinke says she had just passed over the bridge. So they exploded the bridge, and then we had to go back about a mile or maybe more. As soon as they we had to go back. We had to get off the wagons quick because they were shooting at us from the small airplanes. And we just ran into the under the trees, but I think they didn't even have leaves. It was January. and But then we could just hear the bullets zzz around our ears from back and forth and back and forth. We were being shot at. And so after the shooting stopped, we ran to our wagons quick and on the wagons and tore it home again. 
And then we drove to, there was a Hitler youth camp, and there were, it was empty, it was like barracks. It was getting dark too, and we stayed there in the barracks. So in the morning, somebody told us that there was a little shed close to the refugee, this barracks there. They had these little dishes um, we could, could wash yourself in. And somebody said we could go and get him. Everybody can get get one. And so Erwin and me went over there to get one. And we did notice that little Ingrid, two and a half, was following us. And we didn't see her. And all of a sudden, we thought we were going to go back to the barracks with just a little file, maybe, maybe um, two minutes. All of a sudden, a Russian tank comes with machine guns and shoots, shoots, truck, 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 all over us with the machine guns. And, and we run home into our barrack, and mom says, where is Ingrid? And Ingrid was lost, and the shooting was going on for a while. And we run from barrack to barrack looking for Ingrid. We couldn't find her. And all of a sudden, we were in one barrack, and floor, in the entrance floor or somewhere, she was standing screaming. Everybody was just taking care of their own family. Nobody cared for her somebody else's child that they didn't know, and this was shooting, going on, people screaming in horror. The horses went, were chained to the, ho to the wagons, and those that were shot, they would go on their hind legs and the, the front legs into the air, screaming. If, if we died, we wanted at least to have Ingrid with us, you know. And so when, then when we found Ingrid, we were just so happy, no matter if we get killed, we have her now. She left us her first greeting by the Russians. And the tank left, and we all packed and started to drive back home. Mm -hmm. Way back from near Shrim, we drove, and then the Polish, when we passed by the big, large farms with all the Polish workers, they were standing by the street and waiting for us wagons to and then steal what we still had on a little bit that we had on our wagons. And we didn't have much because we had on our wagon because we were so many people just sitting in the, in the wagon. Then we drove further, further to home. Then at one spot we stopped. We got, and then we got into all the Russians. And there were a lot of Russian soldiers. There was like a little forest, whatever. But there were shacks too, farm shacks. And then the Russians were all over us, and the Russian soldiers. And they came to our wagon, and my sister still had her uh, accordion. And they took the accordion and one pulled this way, one pulled that way. And my sister cried, please leave me the accordion, but they took it anyway. And then they took the girls off the wagons and took them in a shed and raped them. That's the first time Vali was raped, twice. That was terrible for them to have been raped. She was a virgin, she was only barely 17. You know, and so being raped twice right away. And then the other girls were raped too and then came back to the wagon and then we could leave. I was, I was very young looking for my age, and I, I had, I wasn't developed yet really, you know. Most girls in my age, they were younger than me, but they had breasts, you know. And, um, and so my girlfriends were raped, they were only 14. And so, so then we drove, kept driving home, but we came to the farm. It was late, kind of at night, it was dark already, everything was snow and cold, and, and our whole farm, the, between the barns and the house, everything was, you know, it was a large place. It was all full of Russian tanks. And the house, the old house was for Russian soldiers, and the new house was for higher officials, Russian officials. And this, and then that night we were so exhausted. Uh, we, we unpacked a few things into the barn by the cows, at least it was warm and a fresh straw and slept there. And when we wanted to sleep, we were so tired. And one Russian soldier, what we unpacked, he stood there too, so stood there and then they told each other, we're gonna make that girl pointed at Vali a baby tonight. And my mom was so worried what's gonna happen. But then later on at night, a Russian from the higher officials came with a gun and walked back and forth of us for, he harassed us for about two hours. He's gonna shoot us, he's gonna shoot us, he's gonna shoot us. And he says the German soldiers shot children too, and he's going to shoot us when they took over Russia. And all we could do was just pray. We sat there praying, and we were so exhausted. Then he says at 4 o'clock at night, he's going to come and shoot us, kill us. 
But we fell asleep. We woke up maybe at 7 o'clock. We were so tired. And we could, all we could have done when they did come at 4 and shoot us, they probably take us out maybe in the snow and put us in a row and shoot us. And I had the feeling we were going to all be going to lay there and dead. Some of them were not completely dead yet in the blood. And, and that's what I was afraid of. We just left in, lived in the old house in that tiny little room for a couple of weeks. And, uh, and then at night, the, the Russian soldiers would come and knock with guns on the window. We had to open up and they came in and raped my mom. I never knew that my grandmother was 80 and she was raped three times too. We didn't have no light, but then when they turned on the matches to find another woman, you know, after a while, and then we could see what was going on. But nobody ever talked to the children, explained after a while. We should have been counseled after what nobody who counseled, nobody even talked about it. And we children, we screamed a lot. And one night, uh, that was the only time a young soldier uh, looked at me, and then he came to me, wanted to rape me and Uncle Eddie, and then Uncle Erwin grabbed, my, grabbed me around, and he screamed, and I screamed, and, and then he touched my breast, and there was nothing there. And so he left, and had two thin braids, and then he left me. And that's the only time that I almost got raped. How later. long did this go on, this period? About three weeks, at least three weeks. Sometimes they came in and, and then they would look look at us real tricky and then fill the gun with the suit and then shoot through the ceiling. And You know, when in a tiny room with so many people and then they shoot through the ceiling, for about five minutes you can't, you can't hear nothing. You're just numb. Your brain is so in shock and your ears plucked up from the shock. And then my sister had enough. She didn't want to live anymore. And then she told my grandmother she wants to get rat poisoning and kill herself. And my grandmother says, God did give you, he gave you life and he, you're not, you cannot kill yourself. That's a sin. We moved from Carbon 2 to Carbon 1, where our school was, to next town, two miles, two kilometers away. Moved into this old shack and um, we worked for this farmer, Hizak was the name. Then we worked on his farm, I think it was from March or April um, till uh, October, we worked on that farm. It was about summertime, maybe July, all of a sudden, the news came through that, I don't know who told my mom that we were going to be taken out, the Germans would be taken out of Poland. And we were so happy. Oh, we were so, because we had to work so hard to in the field and then milk cows three times a day and and we only got milk, cheap milk soup and cold potatoes from the dinner last, from the day before. The townsman was over the town, came and told them we had to be ready tomorrow morning at 8. We packed all night the feather beds and everything. The Polish farmer took us to Straka. We were supposed to meet there at 8 o'clock. I was to the church. Lutheran Church in Strakow. And so they put, put all the German women with children, the men were gone, each one in one spot, about five by five or five by eight. And everybody put their packages that they still had in one spot. And then they, and then the police came and told everybody from us out. And only one person could stay with the packages, while he stayed with the packages. And then, and it was October cold already. And then, uh, then the, after everybody was out, the police went in again and told Vali, the last person, take food and go out too. And Vali takes the can with the, with the meat and the, and the little flour and, um, and the little can with the blood and goes out and the policeman grabs the, the can with the 12 liter, liter uh, can with meat with the little pig meat and takes it for himself and steal that away from her. So we all we had that little, that little can with lard and little flour. And, and so we were left with nothing. No feather bed, no nothing. So my mom screamed and, and, I, and people cried because they lost everything. The woman with all the children had to go with no blanket, no spoon, no cup, no nothing. And then my mom screamed, shoot, shoot us, shoot us, please, I, don't, I can't live anymore. There was one screaming and just crying and misery. And that day, and we were, uh, people were so tired already and then going through this horror. 
and then they put us in wagons again to Russian, 18 kilometers to Russian, to the to a bar, to a refugee barracks for four days. And then finally we arrived in Russian. And these barracks, your mind is so worn out physically and mentally that you cannot grasp anything anymore. And then I lost my mind. I could some moments I remembered. I me, I noticed I could know who my mom was. In some moments, everything was just dark, blurry, and I couldn't, I didn't have the strength to look at anybody, so I was just laid like this, you know. And then she got, she lost her mind the same as I did my mom at that time. But then during these four days at night, Polish boys would more, boys would more come in and harass the people, give us, give us everything you have, or if, if we look around and you still have something, we're gonna kill you. Then we had to walk a long time to the train station. We had to walk and walk and walk so long in the evening, short before evening, and all the Polish people were standing on the street and laughing at us and laughing at us for joy that we were being in a miserable position now. And then we got to the station, and then that night, almost closer to the morning, we, we were put in trains. The train was they didn't even clean out the horse manure to put us in there. We got on a train, and then we drove toward Frankfurt Oder, and, uh, and before Frankfurt Oder, and then they stopped the train. We came into Frankfurt Oder, and all of a sudden, everybody spoke German. We were in Germany. Then we went to Berlin, and we were in Berlin, and Anhalter Bahnhof, I remember one was Anhalter Bahnhof, so we, we all went into the streetcars, getting into streetcars, hanging on outside to the next train station. Then we slept, and the train station was just over in a large entrance hall, you know, cement floors. And we slept down there. Grandma slept on the floor, and we still had the flour, but no bread. We were all so hungry from, from before Frankfurt order. All these days, we had nothing to eat. She took flour without salt, and. She cooked a little with water and flour, and everybody had two tablespoons for that night. At least we had something in our stomachs. I'm surprised my little brothers and sisters, they were like little lambs. They didn't cry, I'm hungry. They just followed like little sheep. They were such good kids. I think this pressure and fear, it takes all the hunger away from you. When we arrived finally in, in Hohenturm, near Halle, where our friends live, relatives lived, now as refugees, and then we, we started walking. It was about two mile walk, at least a two mile or three mile walk, maybe, to the relatives. And we walk, maybe for a mile, and all of a sudden, some woman come running. And it was my dad's sister, Ida Sheila, and my cousin, her daughter-in-law, Annie, and Lydia. They come running toward us, and then they came and led us home where they lived. And we moved in with them. We took a bed. We hadn't had a bed for two weeks. Always the same, nothing to change. We took a bed first, and we were full of lies from living with too many people all over, in the straw mats and the trains. And then, I'm telling you, and then my dad's other sister, Lydia's mom, lived in the next door, and she went out there and looked for something. She found a, a man's underwear all in one, only a hole in the back, you know, with long sleeves and underwear, long pants, like the long jeans, and then everything was in one. And I put that on, and after I didn't, I felt happier being clean and having a bed and clean clothes than a king would have been. We worked on a farm there, and we lived there from Bookshop before we lived with my aunts for about two months almost. And then we, for five weeks, and shortly before Christmas, from November 4th, we arrived. And shortly before Christmas, we, we could move into our own place. It's so wonderful to have our own place. Mm -hmm. We worked there from shortly before Christmas till about the beginning of February. And then we moved to West Germany, June, I think, and then to West Germany. To Rosenberg, near Neuenwege, we found a little room. This one little room in the barracks in Neuenwege. It was a stove, we made a little stove from some, from some, some material, two little holes, and then that's what we cooked on. And we had no wood, 
we have this wet wood, we had no nothing to keep our wood. The wood was frozen and snow on it. We pulled it out little pieces and we almost froze to death. We had no clothes. And then there, all of a sudden, we got a telegram from Tante Ida, from Hohenturm. Julius had sich heute gemeldet. They, f they found my dad. He was just came home, came from Russia prison, from deep in Russia he worked there. So he got malaria. His people died like flies over there. They got such bad food. And then he got malaria. And then they let him go, very sick. He was in the hospital, and the valley, and the valley went over and t took him out of the hospital. That's my little sister Ingrid got killed, and we lived close to the highway, and she crossed the street, and she, a doctor from Rudenscheid met in-laws, and he killed my sister. When she was killed so suddenly, it was just such a shock. It was just so horrible for all of her family. Again, sorrow. When I saw her dead, it was just horrible. I just, I just collapsed. And sometimes when I rode my bike, I only felt good when I was with my family, you know, fairly good. I ride my, I rode my bike by myself to the city and other way, to the forest, this little road. I cried aloud. Nobody came here, but everybody was there at home. So I already knew Daddy and I thought, how? How could he handle his family being murdered by Russian soldiers? That's why I, I couldn't, I could understand him. He was so everything keep, he kept everything inside when he went through the concentration camp and being terribly hungry and mistreated and people were dying of typhus and he had typhus and he was so sick and high fever and people were screaming and, and in misery and his parents had just been killed already. He says he, he never shared any trouble, sorrow with him, anybody. Nobody understood him anyway, because everybody else had their own sorrow. There were refugees in that area from 46 to 51, November, me, and then my parents came in, in next year in April to America. A day before I left, I, Dad and he got engaged. And I cried, and all of a sudden, I'm, I, was, I was afraid of water. And now out by myself, I have to go to America. I didn't know the language. I didn't know my uncle and aunt, my mom's uncle and aunt. And I didn't know English. And I, over the water, swimming in a boat, what if the boat goes down? And I drowned, and I started crying on my engagement day. I was so heartbroken. Everybody tried to comfort me. If my family would have gone too, it would have been different, but me all alone. I've never been so responsible for myself. It was fun at the boat. You know, we get into the boat and we have about 13 days now just to swim. And the first night, People were bored, there was nothing, no entertainment. And my girlfriends, I met some girlfriends there. I had my guitar. Daddy gave me a guitar for Christmas for present. I took my guitar to America and I played guitar, Christian songs. The other two girls, three or two or three girls I met, they knew the songs and we sang and I played the guitar. We entertained all the people that were lonely there all evening, Christian songs. And then we got into different high water and the boat started to swim like. And I wanted to go upstairs into my bed, and and I couldn't. I got so terribly seasick, and I didn't even know where, where the ceiling, where the bottom floor was. And uh, then, I, then when I arrived in Cleveland, I felt like I'm in heaven. I felt like in a completely new world. You could turn to, took me to the farmer's market, West Side Farmer's Market on 25th Street, and I could see a pound of pork chops, 39 cents, and five pounds of ground meat, a dollar. And I thought, my family, when they come, they're going to think they're in, in Schlaraffenland, in, in heaven. The family, five months later, my family came, and I, we had rented a place already at Elsie Cook's in those uh, two rooms in a kitchen. And so at least I I'd prepared everything for my parents already. We had a stove, we had a table, we had a old refrigerator. Right? When my parents came, they were just elated. And the windows had plastic drapes, dollar drapes, but it was a place to go or own. And my parents were just so happy. When they came, I had a dinner ready, sauerkraut, pear ribs, and a bushel of apples and a bushel of grapes and bananas. And everybody was so shocked that you can have a bushel of fruit. I, I 
did all to go bed and ate, and I told him for three days, nobody's going to look for a job. You just sleep and eat. Eleven months later, we borrowed money from several people, and I had five hundred dollars saved, and I gave that, and we bought a medium payment and a two-family house. Yeah, I came over almost two years after I came to America, to Cleveland, Ohio. And then four months later, we got married on December 5th, 1953. And then you were born in, in November 6th, 1955. Oh, I was so proud to have a, to be on. Daddy came to visit when you were born. He was just so happy. I had a very st strong mother instinct. I've mothered my little brothers and sisters since they were born.